You're listening to the Pop Punk Revolution Podcast. Here is your host, Sean Zizi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Pop Punk Revolution. And you may have noticed Brian can't be here. He's a very busy guy. He might be busy doing things with today's sponsor, which is Tonal- TonalityStudio.net. For top quality mixes, hit him up and he might be able to help you out. And we have a very special guest here. And do you want to tell us who you are? Hey, I am Doug Heiser. Um, and I uh, am here because I have a band slash online music project called Cohill. All right. Cohill is an awesome band. If he wasn't awesome, he wouldn't be here talking to us. So tell us a little bit about that project. Where are you from also? Yeah, so I am from Toronto, Canada. Um, but a bit about uh, the Cohill project itself. It kind of spans many countries and uh, uh, d- different regions of uh, the world. Uh, so I guess a bit about the project is it's what I would describe as like an online collaboration. Um, I write uh, instrumentals in kind of like the emo, post-hardcore, pop-punk, metalcore type genres. They're all a little bit different, but all kind of grounded in the same aspects. Um, and then uh, what I do is I record them with a producer friend of mine, Kyle Marchant, and then I source uh, different unique singers for each track. So no track, I've got five tracks out right now, and uh, no track has the same singer. It's someone different on each one. Uh, which kind of keeps it fun and interesting. And uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit different, um, but it's it works for me. Okay, I have so many questions from those statements. So first of all, South Park lied to me. You're Canadian. You don't look anything like Terrence and Philip. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Thank you for going along with that. Thank you. So you released a five-song EP, correct? What is that EP called? I just titled it uh, Volume 1. Uh, and then colon, maybe next year. Uh, so just kind of an iteration that I'll be doing more volumes, more, uh, more EPs in the future. And then the maybe next year was, uh, is just a lyric pulled from the song One Year Later. Um, and it was, I guess, lyrically, that was really kind of about being in COVID and quarantine and kind of wanting to get past all this. And I thought that was kind of a very fitting uh, and given that COVID is kind of what spurred this project, I figured that that was kind of like the perfect lyric to kind of encapsulate for like the EP title. Okay. Brian and I spoke about how COVID it was a real boon to creativity. Terrible tragedy, terrible tragedy, but um, a real boon to creativity. So thank you for letting the world hear what you have to say. So I have a few questions about how the songs are created. Do you write the lyrics or do you have the lyrics done to do the people who you hire to sing for you write the lyrics yeah it's a good question and it's one that a lot of people ask so it's good to kind of lay, lay the groundwork out for everyone so i do not write the lyrics i'm not much of a lyric writer so a big thing for me when i was reaching out to vocalists was that they would write the lyrics and melody themselves um a for a few reasons um as i mentioned i'm not good at writing lyrics putting pen to paper kind of putting those thoughts out there and then b uh, I find from a performance and like tracking aspect when the vocalist has the emotion, the thoughts and the feelings themselves, I find that like really comes through in their performance, their takes, and just makes for an overall more like believable song and message. So that was kind of really key for me is um, that the vocalist would do the lyrics themselves. And by me going through the process, I, I did reach out to a few people who were like, I'll do it, but I don't want to write the lyrics. And so for me, that was kind of like a non-starter. Um, I really wanted people that would be part of the creative journey for themselves. Anything goes with your lyrics or do you have like a set parameter? Do you say, I kind of want this song to be about this or you just let them free for all go for it? Yeah, I don't think I gave anyone parameters. Um, I pretty much gave them a blank slate and said, hey, it's I want you to have creative control. I want you to uh, speak to what you're feeling right now. And uh, everyone really delivered uh, from a lyrical message. There was... I never got anything back where I was like, ooh, that's kind of dicey or that's kind of lame or uh, cliche. Um, So I find when you kind of give people the control and what what they want to do, it it, kind of warded itself. Uh, There was only one song where the guy kind of just wanted a jumping off point. And so we kind of just 
gave him some like macro topics, like kind of like use this as your starting point. And then he went with it from there. Um, but it was really just very high level, like, hey, just kind of stick to this. That sounds great. So where do you find these vocalists? Where do you vet them? How do you, you know what I mean? How do you get mm-hmm. get them, you know? Yeah, so it all starts with the song. So I get the the demo going. And once I listen to the demo, I get an idea of what style of vocal I personally envision. And um, then it, I guess the other fold is I need to be realistic about the level of artist I can reach out to and get to do the project, right? Like, I, certainly doing this, I had no streams, I had no followers, no numbers. So it was really, um, people were kind of taking the leap of faith that I was going to put together a good project. So I started with like kind of smaller bands, regional bands, local bands um, that I thought would be interested in doing something creative that would be eager to feature and kind of work with an up and coming artist or aspiring artist. Um, so, I mean, obviously if I reached out to someone like Caleb Shomo or, or uh, <laughs> Shane told, like, they'd be like, Oh, who the hell is this guy? So I had to be realistic with like artist size of like, who, who it could be. Um, so that was kind of like the other caveat of when I was reaching out to people. But stylistically, it was really about, okay, here's the song and instrumental I have. And then I'd kind of just go through Spotify and kind of look at who I was like, oh, this person would sound good on it. Um, and so I'd kind of just find like bands that were kind of adjacent to the sound without it being like, without it wanting it to sound like it could be their band, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So you found people at a certain level, nobody like, uh, you know, you weren't reaching out to Ronnie Radke or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously not. Yeah. I knew that would probably just end up with a lot of ignored messages or unread messages or, um, high quotes to do the work. So <laughs> I figured I'd kind of stick with at like an art reasonable level for the artists that we're uh, reaching out to. So who's your drummer? You ever uh, think about Travis Barker? <laughs> Well, it seems like he's playing on everything, so I who know. knows? <laughs> maybe. I just need a, need a little hip-hop elements, and maybe he'd do it. Yeah, you make it happen. <laughs> but, but honestly, uh, who drums for you? Do you, have a, do, you, do you hire somebody, or is it all programmed? Uh, so I had a friend. So the, produce, the guy who produced it, Kyle Merchant, um, we had the drummer from his band do it. So his, his band's called Nightwell. Um, his vocalist actually does the bridge feature, uh, the screaming feature on one year later. So I kind of really tapped into his band as an asset. Um, and he did, uh, the, the drumming for the whole, uh, EP. So all five tracks. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. It's really great. You have those resources. So tell me more about Kyle Merchant, Merchant, right? Kyle Merchant. Uh, Mark Merchant, M-A-R-C-H-A-N-T. Kyle Merchant. Don't want to yeah. ru- don't want to mess that guy's <laughs> name up. He might be like a top level producer, and he's like, "Who's this Sean guy from Black It Out?" Ooh, he he got my name wrong when I when you interviewed uh, Doug. Ooh, can't work with you. So tell me more about this guy's deal. Yeah, so Kyle was a uh, he was a producer I worked with on another band I had pre COVID. Um, uh, I did a an EP with him that he engineered, and then uh, during COVID, I started writing songs and. Uh, he was kind of like the first person that came to mind because I know he's like big into like the emo post hardcore music himself. So I was like, he'd be like the great person, uh, a great person to work on it with. And so um, I just, yeah, reached out to him again after having a good experience prior to that. And before that first time, he was kind of uh, just a word of mouth reference when I was kind of reaching out to other musicians in Toronto being like, hey, who are you guys working with? Who would you recommend? That's, that's, does good work. And so he just kind of came as a reference through a mutual friend. So you met him through another person, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you didn't Which have... I guess speaks to the importance of networking as a producer, right? So you were talking to me a bit about networking before this. Do you have any advice for bands to network? To me, the starting point with like networking is reaching out and connecting on social media with bands that are in a similar genre as you and as a kind of a a similar size and just certainly with bands that like want to tour and do regional shows um it's really important to kind of have that network so you can say like kind of using my geography as an example 
there's kind of uh, three or four major metropolitan areas within like four hours of each other. So like you want to start connecting with bands that are in Ottawa, Montreal, London, Ontario, Hamilton, and having that network so that you can do shows together that when a Hamilton band comes to Toronto, you can play with them. And then when you go to Hamilton, they have you on a bill. You kind of build your show network that way. And to me, that really starts with like social media, Instagram, kind of uh, doing your research on what bands are active, doing a, sharing similar goals as you and bringing each other up at the same time. And something as simple as when each other releases new music, it's something as simple as like sharing, hey, my buddy's in Nightwell, just released a new track. If you like my stuff, you'll probably like them as well. Um, and then you just kind of build the camaraderie from there. You know, I know another Canadian emo pop punk guy named Andy Negative. You may know him. I do know Andy very well. I actually have like a, uh, a social media um, group chat with him and a few other like content creators. So I talk to him almost a few times a week, actually. Yeah. Mm hmm. And so, th yeah, that, that's another networking example, like uh, for like my social media and because I'm like really big into TikTok and trying to like build followers on, on those platforms. And so we've got like a, a group chat of like other pop punk emo uh, musicians that are active on social media. And just kind of the genesis was like, hey, let's create a group chat, like use it to bounce ideas off each other. But also when you post a video, throw the link, we'll give it a like and watch right off the get-go and kind of help its trajectory and the various social media algorithms. So that's how you do it. <laughs> that's how I do it. Well, everybody, the secret is out. You guys got your pen and papers, write it down. This guy's the master. He knows what's up. So anyhow, so you guys work together by really supporting each other, by maybe liking the video commenting it or sharing it with other people and all that stuff yeah exactly it's exactly especially like a platform like tiktok it's um it's super based on uh engagement uh watch percentage um from like the the early few minutes that it goes and the better it does the better engagement the more people are watching it through it starts to cascade it out like a like a pyramid almost like it starts small and, and scatters it out so you really want to have that early engagement a high watch percentage and so the theory was like well if i can have 10 friends like it off the get-go that'll really help it get out to more people and so it's really like uh i scratch your back you scratch my back whenever we uh release new videos type thing so it's not a pyramid scheme <laughs> i guess it's our own little pyramid scheme <laughs> oh he admits it it's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> no, I'm playing. I'm playing. But yeah, so you mentioned TikTok. I think we talked about this before. You mentioned that TikTok's like a really huge tool for you. Like that's really, really helped you. Tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, to me, TikTok and I guess now IG Reels, are, to me, are really the only social media platforms where you can really expose yourself to uh, new fans and a new audience without having to pay for it. Because you think about like how Facebook and Instagram and Instagram have really changed from a posting perspective. Like you might have 5,000 fans or followers on Facebook, but you really have to pay for a sponsored ad for it to get to those 5,000 people. Whereas TikTok not only does like your video go to your followers, it also reaches new for you pages on the browsing, the, the browsing mechanism. So, um, and you don't have to pay for that exposure. Yes. There are there is an ad aspect to it, but it's not as heavy as say like a Facebook or an Instagram are. Um, so to me, like it, it's a no brainer that bands want to be on TikTok. Bands should find a way to do videos that are authentic to them, that are like not cringy. If if that's why they're <laughs> they're if they're resistant to it, I know a lot of bands are right now because they as associate it with like kind of dancing and lip syncing type videos. But um, it's there, there's so much more to the app than that. And uh, to me, if you, if you want to make it in uh, 2022, you really have to be on that app, getting in front of new people. I gotta be honest, uh, my band Black It Out. I we we put some things on TikTok, but I really really am afraid to get on there because I don't want to be doing the, the little shake your booty dances. I'm not really into it. But um, I like what you do, though. 
you do the almost every video you give the you give the camera a look like the people's eyebrow like the rock you know you're always like only, yeah, the, the name that tune videos, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You give it the people's elbow, elbow, elbow. Oh my goodness, eyebrow, and you're like, name only elder emos know this tune. So pretty much exactly. only, the, only the cool kids know this tune. So that's part of like the I guess like a TikTok strategy in itself is like you have like an anchor comment that like only elder emos, which is kind of a TikTok trendy term now that people either hate or love. But like, I'll start like a video, like only elder emos will know this song. And right away, like if you're kind of like, if the video is in someone's feed, they're like, okay, I want to see if I can know this song. So it, it grabs viewers attention right away and hooks them in to want to watch the video and then either like it, guess the song, prove to me that they can determine what the song is from either three or four notes type deal. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a way that I've, I've hooked people into my music as well, because I also say hey please check out my band and so I, it's kind of like a, a bait and swap approach it's like hey let me play songs that you know and love and kind of have a fun engaging platform for followers but hey while you're here i hope you'll also check out my music too and that works it does work yeah i i mean i'm not gonna lie like the bulk of pe like i've got eight thousand followers on tiktok and 99 percent just want me to play hawthorne heights and under oath songs <laughs> But you know what, I, I, there's a lot, I get a lot of comments throughout the week being like, hey, like, I also decided, I also checked out your band, sounds really good. It's like, the fact that like, I've built out, like, I'd rather have those 8,000 followers there to like, hopefully get them into my music versus not there, right? So part of my strategy was like, you know, what, I'm just going to kind of like, have fun playing music that I like. Because uh, it, it tells, like, even though I'm playing a little bit of covers and, and other like, stuff like that. It, it's still like a glimpse into like my personality, into like my history, like my influences. So it still gives them like insight as to who I, who I am as like a musician and a person. Uh, while also like providing some like fun and engaging content. And then hopefully a few percent of them also decide to click on the link in my profile and then get to my music on Spotify or Apple. That's awesome. So let me get your strategy straight so everyone could have it clear. First of all, you do the people's eyebrow. And you force people to name five songs because they're wearing the t-shirt. I'm kidding. You know the you know the joke of like, oh, you're yeah, wearing yeah. a Hawthorne Zeit, uh, Height t-shirt. Name five songs. So you give them that feeling that they got to give you, show you that you have the street cred, which is a great thing because people, of course, they want to engage and be like, yeah, I do know that song. That is totally, um, you know, I can't even think of a song right now, <laughs> but... um. <laughs> But yeah, it's totally this song, and then you hit them with, hey, I'm in a band called Cohill. You might like us. Exactly. And uh, you know what? A lot of people probably won't go and click that link, but either way, like I have fun making the video, so it, to me, it's like nothing gained, nothing lost. Um, but then, yeah, there's, I've, I've seen like, when I have like a good video, like reach and like view count, I do notice like a spike in like my Spotify uh, st streams and everything. So. There is a correlation to like when a video does well, when I plug my band and seeing traffic go to my Spotify. So yeah, it, it's working. Um, mind you, there, there are other bands that do it way better. Like you think about like bands like Magnolia Park um, who dominate TikTok on, from like a emo and pop punk standpoint. Like they, and a lot of what they do is they just chop up their music video. Uh, which is what a lot of bands can easily do to get on the platform is they just chop up their music video, play the chorus, and that's the video. They, they have the lyrics scrolling across and it's catchy and it gets stuck in people's heads. And uh, they really flourished on that app and they've, they're a great one to kind of mimic and watch what they do. Cause like, look at them there. They open for Mayday Parade. They are now on tour with Sum 41 and Simple Plan. Like, and it's all because really TikTok accelerated that band to new heights. All from TikTok. Uh, I'd, I'd say it's it's not all from TikTok. They're they're good songwriters. They've got good, they've got like the assets there. But like they promoted the shit out of themselves on that app and made thousands and thousands of fans. And sure enough, like Simple Plan, Pierre's like super active on TikTok, and I'm sure that that's how they got on that tour. Is they're popping up on simple plans feed all the time and they're probably like hey we need to bring this band on tour with us they're hard working they promote themselves they'll promote the tour if they're the opening band 
and it, it's rewarded them. And there, there's like other great examples of bands that have blown up from TikTok. Action Adventure got signed to Pure Noise Records. Um, First and Forever are now on tour with Broadside. They were another big TikTok band. Um, so there, there's lots of examples of, of like young, fresh bands that are now getting these touring opportunities, getting record deals, um, because they're putting the work to promote themselves on this most, the most widely used social media app. Okay, so you need to have great sounding songs before you really get in on this. It definitely helps, right? Because a, a lot of what these bands are doing is they're lip syncing or like doing some sort of performance style to their uh, chorus, obviously like the catchiest part of their song. And they're posting that 20 times a week. So that's getting stuck in people's heads. It's never leaving their thought of minds. Like uh, they're just drilling that song, that chorus into you so that you then go and stream it and become a fan. So yeah, I'd say it, it definitely starts with the song um, for sure. So 20 times a week, is that a hard and set rule or is that a, a ballpark thing you just kind of <laughs> pulled out of your ass? That, that's me pulling, grabbing, just grabbing, grabbing numbers out right. of the ear. But you, I, just like, <laughs> I just think about like how many times I see Magnolia Park pop up on my For You page and it's the same hook, slightly different video from what I saw two hours ago. And it's always in my feed, always, always hearing the, the, that chorus. So you think the spamming works? I think it works, that's for sure. Just be not cringe. Don't be cringe. You can be cringe if you want to be. I'd say, like, there's some people that don't mind doing that sort of, like, lip syncy uh, performance style thing into the camera. Other people will find that cringy and not want to do that sort of content. But um, which, that's not my style either. Like, I'm not about to, like, lip sync to a video and kind of, like, pretend I'm performing live or anything. So, like, I'm not going to do that type of video. Other, there's lots of other people that do that, um, so what, whatever works for people. But I think there's, there's a way to use the app in a way that's authentic and true to who you are. And once you kind of figure out how you're comfortable on the app, you just kind of keep doing it, keep drilling it in, and uh, sure enough, you're going to reach new people. So be true to you. That is probably the most important thing you could tell people because authenticity is important in your music as well as your presentation. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. And I guess using that last, ex the last example I just gave, like I'm not like an overly like animated and like eccentric person, which is why I'm not going to like do those like high, like fake performance type videos. Like it's not who I am. And I think if I try to do it, it, it would look forced. It would look clunky and robotic. Whereas like there's other people that love to get in the camera and, sing and and give that type of passionate performance to a, a digital audience they can't see and, and that comes across in it so um yeah people can see through like fake performance and stuff like that so that's that's kind of why i've never really done that um so it works for some people it doesn't work for others um that's kind of why i stick to those covers and then plug my music in between so are you working on anything new for Cohill, anything that is happening right now with Cohill, because we've already talked about maybe next year, volume one, right? Volume one, maybe next year. So what's going on with you in, in this present time? I've got stuff in the works right now. So I, I mean, in an ideal world, I would have had a song out by now, but I've ran into some delays <laughs> from a recording standpoint. Um, but I've got two songs in the pipeline. Um, one is now fully recorded. It's just waiting to be mixed. So um, timeline probably looking uh, late July, early August for my next release. Um, really excited about that one. I've got a great vocalist on it um, who absolutely crushed it. He was like perfect for the style. It's very like under oathy. Um, so like I can't wait for people to hear that one. Uh, so that one's uh, just waiting to be mixed. And then I've got... Uh, another demo sitting with another vocalist right now. Um, and he's, uh, he's working on vocals for that one. So uh, one song that's like fully fleshed out, one song that's still kind of demo stage. And then um, I've got like a, a pipeline of other demos and ideas. Uh, so just waiting to kind of get in my next session with Kyle to keep, keep the, the content coming, keep the songs rolling. All right. So you're going to spill who your vocalist is or you're going to keep that for release? <laughs> Uh, what, when do you think this will come out? 
I don't know. You said July or August, right? Oh, when this will come out. Oh, goodness. Yeah, when are you going to drop this? That will depend on if I spill it. <laughs> well, do you want me to hold on? Want us to hold on to it to your release, or do you want us to just drop it ASAP? You can drop it ASAP. I'll hold on to the vocalist uh, okay, okay. for now. Uh, just because like, I kind of like do like a whole like build up, like I guessing game and, and hype thing on like who the vocalist oh, is. So. Yeah, I guess that Pokemon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of do like a guess that Pokemon type thing and, and do like a slow reveal uh, what the vocalist is. Um, not that it's like uh, an internationally recognized name or anything, but it, it's still fu- kind of fun to like hype yeah. it, kind of get people throwing comments around, tagging vocalists and stuff. So um, there's a bit of strategy again with like the marketing aspect to like the reveal of who the vocalist is, who's collaborated on the song with me. Um, drive some engagement and, and fun for people. So um, I'll, I'll just hold on to the vocalist name and uh, <laughs> don't want to tie up your, your ability to kind of release this podcast and video. That's totally fine. No, no, it's all, this is all about you. And if you don't want to talk about it, that is completely fine. So <laughs> thank you for, for all of that. So any other things going on? Any merchandise available for Cohill coming out or is that still in the pipeline? Yeah, so I've been, uh, I actually have my first design, uh, my first shirt, it'll probably be out probably by the time this goes live. So I, I, I was always a little like slow and gun shy about like printing shirts and stuff. And uh, recently the time felt right. Um, I've had enough comments of people being like, hey, do you have any shirts? Do you have any merchandise? So um, I finally pulled the trigger on getting a design together. Uh, it's uh, at the print shop right now. So I'm hopefully picking up the shirts this week. So I will have a shirt coming out uh, within probably one or two weeks. So um, excited about that. And everyone should get the first, <laughs> the first shirt <laughs> when it comes out because it's the first run ever. So is that a demand? You're demanding everyone to get, you, uh, get your first shirt or, or else? Or else what? Or else I can't afford to do uh, more songs. <laughs> oh, you hear that, guys? If you no more Cohill, if you don't buy his shirt, no more Cohill, and we don't want that. So I guess, uh, I guess I might have to buy one. Exactly. <laughs> I need money in to to keep the songs coming out. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. So, who who designed the shirt? This guy David, who's in uh, a band called Rosu, a Colorado band. Uh, he has a design, or I guess a graphics company called uh, Sundine Designs or Sun, I actually don't know how to pronounce it. I've never heard, there's two ways to how I would pronounce it. It's either Sundine or Sundine, S-U-N-D-I-N-E, uh, design. So uh, I actually don't know which way it's supposed to be pronounced, um, but he, he was the one that uh, drew up the, uh, uh, the design for me. He's also done some other like social media creative assets for me as well. So uh, he's kind of like some guy I regularly reach out to for uh, images, content, graphics, that type of thing. So he's your guy. He's one of my guys. I've, I've got a, quite a few people uh, for uh, graphics and stuff, depending on what it is. Yeah, multiple guys. Multiple guys. All right. So you were talking to me about playlisting as well. You, you run up multiple playlists. Want to tell me a little bit about how you go about that and what that's all about? Also kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier with like the networking thing. So like uh, the playlist thing for me was another way to kind of like reach out to bands, connect with other artists in the scene more so with like the, the idea like hey like check out my music i'll put you guys on my playlist um so yeah i've got like i now have, uh, three playlists i run uh, like a metalcore one a pop punk one and then just kind of like a amalgamated one of of both uh of both genres and uh yeah i i, I plug them and promote them heavily both on social media and um whether it's uh plugging them on tiktok or doing like new release type videos so uh, I'm always like uh, trying to promote them, get uh, bands listens, um, and because I, I kind of mainly built them with the genesis that like everyone's main goal when they release a song is to get on that Spotify editorial playlist, which is almost impossible and never happens. So I figured like you know what I'm gonna start building my own user playlists and promote them and try and encourage people to listen to them, and so that way, hey, if you didn't get on the Spotify one, well. Doug's got a playlist. It might not get you thousands of streams, but hey, it's I, I do promote them. I do I do know there are people that actively listen to them and, and use it to find new music. So uh, it is a resource to try and get a few new fans, a few new listens, and um, 
yeah, it's something I like to do. It's a great way for me to discover new music. And it's been a great way for me to build my uh, musician network out there as well. I know Black It Out has been on several of your playlists, and we do show up on your Discovered, our Discovered on. You show up on our Discovered on. Do you want to say the playlist name so people know what to look for on Spotify? They're a little generic, so they might be hard to search. So one's called New Metalcore. Uh, that's obviously like my metalcore playlist. Uh, then I've got one called Underground Pop Punk. And then uh, the other one's called New Alternative. So a little generic sounding. Um, uh, so a, a bunch of things might pop up if you search them. But if uh, you go to my band page, I have them uh, pinned uh, at the bottom. So if you go to my Cohill Spotify page, scroll to the bottom, I've got the playlist pinned uh, that you can click on, follow. Uh, if you want to kind of discover some more underground bands and what pops up in your uh, Spotify editorials. How do people submit to you? How do people get on your playlist? Two main ways. So I have them hosted on a site called dailyplaylists.com. Uh, that's a just a, a nice submission portal. Uh, that's a lot more friendly than, say, like a submit hub. Uh, but it's also less known. So I kind of like to plug that one as a good site for bands to check out. Uh, so it's on daily playlists. Uh, people go in there, they uh, select what genre of music they're submitting to, and then it kind of it shows you all the playlists uh, that kind of meet that uh, meet that criteria. Uh, so then, for example, if they see my playlist and they want to submit to it, um, for example, if they selected pop punk, they want to find pop punk playlists. Um, they'll see my underground pop punk one. They check a box and check what other ones they want to submit to, and they click submit. And then uh, as a curator, I've got a curator uh, dashboard. Um, so I go in there every few days and um, I see like a whole list of the songs that were submitted to me. And I just hit play. I get a sample of the song and I either hit accept or decline. Um, that's one way. And then the other way is a lot of people reach out to me on uh, Instagram or Facebook. And once they've already reached out there, instead of just telling them to go check out that website, I'm like, yeah, just send me the link. and. Uh, We'll go from there. So those are really the main two ways that people have submitted to me. That's really great. I like Daily Playlist myself. I use it as a curator since we do the Pop Punk Revolution playlist. You're on there, mm -hmm. by the way. Ghosts is on there. Great track. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I see it pop up on my source of streams. So it's Heck getting yeah. streams on your playlist too. Heck yeah. I, I kind of promote. I kind of promote. And I, and I have to say that is probably one of my favorite tracks off of volume one maybe next year i also love thank you i also love um what's that one the year one what's the name of it maybe next year one year um, later one year later oh my goodness yeah. i sound like i sound like a terrible interviewer because i forgot the name well maybe next year's the chorus line <laughs> i know it's it's but it's a there are such great songs i, I really thank like you. those songs like that's it's a great ep i really enjoy it. and there's also one uh, my goodness, the one with that, that's talking about religion. Who? Oh, dead weight. Dead weight. Yes, I love yeah, that one. That was that the debut. So, yeah, yeah. So good. So thank good. you, thank you. I don't know why I can't remember the name dead weight. What is wrong with me? I am so sorry, it's, Doug. There's like 50 million songs named dead weight. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for being so kind and understanding, not make me feel like more of a fool than they already do. I appreciate you. Oh, uh, I'm terrible with song names too. So. Oh really? <laughs> I'm like. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I know I could hum you that song's melody or sing along with it, but I couldn't tell you what it's called. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. Thank you for being understanding. So before we go, I have a few things I want to ask you. So mm -hmm. wh what's your inspiration for some of the songs you write? Because I know you put down on, on Instagram and TikTok your inspiration for some of the songs. Want to go over that real quick? From like an artist standpoint, like uh, some of like my favorite stuff is that like, mid 2000s late 2000s post hardcore stuff like under oath seosin from first to last funeral for a friend especially silverstein so like that stuff is probably like the main core influence of uh my music um uh, i just i love that era um and so the the cool thing right now is that there's kind of like a resurgence in popularity with like that music um, we're seeing bands like If I Die First, See Space Cowboy, Static Dress really exploding right now. So um, it's really exciting to kind of see that um, that sound be getting revitalized again. Awesome. Awesome. How long does it take for a vocalist to get back 
your melody and your I know I see the look in your face I see the look in your face you're like ooh that's a touch that might be a touchy subject and you know what I want to go there now because the look in your face let's hear it 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 can take a while so um so I actually had to remove a vocalist from a track um oh. recently I, I won't go into names or anything but uh, he's had the he had the demo since February oh and it yeah and it was a constant thing of uh he, he would send me snippets make it i thought it was getting worked on and then uh mid-may i was just like hey man you know what it's it's just not getting done um i appreciate like the lyrics and everything but like i just have to like find someone else that can get this done quicker um so like out of principle i was just like it's, it's just gone on too long i have to find someone else to do it i think if you scroll back earlier i said i was I thought I would have had a song out in May Uh, because I thought like typical timeline, like I was like, oh, I should be able to have something out by May, early June, the latest. And then just because this vocalist was taking so long to not deliver anything, I it it pushed my whole next cycle EP cycle back several months. So it's kind of unfortunate that it happened. Oh, wow. Okay, so. It took him, so you would just get snippets, right? You wouldn't get like a full demo. And he, how often did he send you snippets? I'd have to like uh, pry for them. I'd have to be like, hey man, like hoping to hear something. Like, um, so I, like not only would it come in snippets, like I had to like really pry to get something out of him, uh, which was the other kind of like frustrating part in the, the creative process. So um, yeah, just kind of that, that's, obviously like the extreme of of it um and obviously it's probably would have taken longer if i had kept him on the project so who's to say how long it would have actually taken to get final tracks from him and then uh i'd say on average it probably takes about one to two months um usually i get like a demo within like a month and then another month for like the full proper tracks um and then there's some guy so like hayden who did dead weight that dude was a beast on his song like he had a demo to me within like three days and then he had like the final tracks within like two weeks like he was the fastest one that i've worked with like he was so quick to it and um freaking delivered an incredible uh lyric and melody on that one that is incredible oh wow Mm -hmm. because i was thinking like you know, sometimes people have trouble in their personal life and they, they can't get to it. If they're give, sending you a demo and say, yo, I can't do this right now, of course, you'd probably be empathetic toward it and give them time. I'm not sure how you feel if you're going to be like, no, I must have it now. You're done, you know. Well, I'd rather like someone be like, like, let me know like what's going on. Like, hey, like this came up, that came up uh, and just kind of give me like a like manage my expectations from like a timeline standpoint right like give me an idea of like what's going on um because either i can start working on another song and like and buy you time to finish your song or if something serious has come up then i can just find someone else to do it so uh that's another like like communication so key with doing it so and i'm like a big communicator i over over communicate if anything so communication is key with Doug from Cohill. So any lucky vocalist who gets to work with Doug, communicate with him or else you're out. Just let me know what's going on. Just let him know what's going on. So Doug, is there anything else you would like to talk about? You know what? I think we covered the main things. I, I think uh, anyone that's, I'll just drive home the message. Anyone that's resistant to TikTok, you got to find a way to make it work for you. Uh, find bands that uh, are inspirations to you. Watch what they're creating on TikTok, what videos they're making, and find a way to do that yourself in a way that's true and authentic. A lot of people think that there's a lot of like time that gets put into like making the videos and creativity, but man, like today, like if you go to my TikTok, I was sitting in traffic and made a six second video that's got several hundred views now, like <laughs> just because I was sitting in traffic, like there's so many ways to get creative on the app and and find little ways to plug your music that like you're really doing yourself a disservice by not doing it on top of it you then you you then just cross post to instagram reels and now you've hit two social media platforms with your video so um bands you got to get on it so tiktok responsibly not while you're driving 
only when you're sitting in traffic. Not moving at all. Pay attention to the road. <laughs> First and foremost, Doug does not, what would you call that, um, espouse? He doesn't uh, promote unsafe driving. Am I right? Don't social media and drive. <laughs> Don't social media and drive. Almost worse than drinking and driving. But it feels like Doug was talking to me directly in my band, Get On TikTok. <laughs> and now I feel stupid. Thanks, Doug. No problem. Like I said, just copy what other people are doing. Find your own way to do it. And uh, there, there's so many easy ways to just fire up content. Like you don't need to do these fully produced videos, like small, simple, short videos. And you're not spending hours doing it. It's so easy. So keep it simple, stupid, is what he's saying. He called me stupid, and he's saying, keep it simple, stupid. So you didn't call me stupid. I'm just messing with you, Doug. Anyhow, you want to plug your socials before we roll, or you got anything else you want to just put out there for everybody? Yeah, I'll plug the socials. Uh, Instagram, you can find me. My handle's at Cohill Music, C-O-E-H-I-L-L Music. Um, Facebook is the same handle, facebook.com slash Cohill Music. And then uh, TikTok, I'm just at Cohill. I was able to get that, do that, that domain. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I wanted to ask you where you got your name. I forgot oh, to ask you Oh, my name. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Cohill, uh, the name came from the street I was living on uh, during, uh, for the past few years. So, and where I wrote all the music. So I was living in a street called Cohill Drive. Oh. Um, and when I was uh, trying to come up with a name that was on like my short list of uh, ideas and uh, when I was kind of like sharing the short list out to people a lot of people liked that one and so I was like perfect uh, it's uh, people seem to like the name then it also it also does have uh, a meaning to it because it's that's where I live that's where I wrote uh, the first EP um, so it's not just kind of like a, a name grabbed out of thin air it's it, it actually means something so it's a cool memorable name I must agree Sorry, it's also a, uh, a little town in the province we live in. So a lot of people ask me if I'm from Cohill, oh. uh, the town. I think it's the, the town's got like 3,000 people in it, like super small town. Um, so that's a question I get a lot on TikTok. It's like, are you from Cohill, the small town that I just drove through? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm from Cohill, but it's a street, not the city <laughs> or town that you're referencing. That's funny. So the street's pretty big. So you didn't just dox yourself, did you? You know, it's it's a small street. Oh, <laughs> but, but I don't I don't I don't live there anymore. I, I moved oh, okay. uh, last month, so I'm not even on there anymore. All right, all but right. I'm not gonna... but I'm not changing the band name. The band I name wouldn't. Stays. <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah, I was gonna say people are gonna send you fan mail. You know, you're gonna get a bunch, or your neighbors gonna get Cohill fan fan mail. That'd be pretty funny. But uh, but yeah, cool. All right, so that's it. Perfect. Nice talking to you. Hey, great talking to you, Doug. It was wonderful having you on. Thank you for being on the Pop Punk Revolution. And to anybody who wants to be on the Pop Punk Revolution, get a hold of Black It Out Band somehow on Instagram or email us or whatever. I'm sure the links will be in the description down below. Hit us up and definitely be sure to check out controlplusspace.com that I write for that. Also check out tonality.net. That's Brian's website where you could get mixes and masters from him. So this is all about you, all about the scene, all about people who make music and enjoy music. So to all those pop punkers, elder emos, whatever you identify as, keep on rocking. Thank you guys so much. See you later, Doug. Thank you. Yeah.